Um, well, anyway, thank the organizers for the opportunity to come here and share some of our um, ideas on the origin of cancer and how we are planning to approach the management of this cancer, of cancer in general. Um, what I like to do is always set the record. Uh, you know, where, where are we? Uh, where are we going with this disease? Um, this is, these are data from the American Cancer Society. And as you can see, the rate, well, I have new cases, deaths per year, deaths per day in the United States. Um, and as you can see, the, the rate of increase in deaths is twice that of the new cases over the last five years. So we can all talk about different kinds of things, but until we actually reduce these numbers, you know, uh, we have a lot of work to do. The question, of course, is, you know, why do these numbers continue to increase? You know, the more money we spend on cancer, the more cancer we get, all right? So, um, and this is, a, this is an abomination. Um, you mean to tell me off there all these years we have not been able to uh, reduce the death rates? And we heard some, some of the other, but it's gonna go out of control here in the next uh, several years. What is the res what's responsible for this failure, this, this abysmal failure in our ability to manage this disease? And a lot of it has to do with how we view the origin of the disease. Because it's my opinion that if we understand the origin of the disease, we'll be able to manage the disease more effectively. Now, we have two con uh, uh, conflicting views on what cancer actually is. Is cancer a nuclear genetic disease according to the somatic mutation theory, which is the dogma that drives the, the majority of the research in cancer field? Or is it a mitochondrial metabolic disease? Because as you can see, we have a mitochondrion and we have a nucleus, all right? And both of these organelles in the disease are abnormal. Now, what I did was I collected over uh, decades worth of research, uh, various observations from the literature that was asking specific questions about how a cancer nucleus might erect, uh, direct development. And I put together these papers, these observations, and I suggest that if you're interested, you should read this paper very carefully. It's one of the more highly uh, uh, cited or, or recognized, let's put it, the reviewed papers in this journal. And uh, it was striking to find that there was massive evidence to, 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 to indicate that cancer is not a genetic disease. And uh, this is the figure that, we, that was generated to summarize the dozens of reports that were never put together except this one time. When you put them all together for the first time, you're able to see the relationships. So in this slide, we know normal cells beget normal cells. Tumor cells beget tumor cells. So, we know that there's many mutations in the nucleus of the tumor cell, and we know that the mitochondria are defective in tumor cells in, in structure, number, and function. But what's responsible for the, for the driving of the neoplastic phenotype? Is it the mutations in the nucleus, or is it defects in the mitochondria? And the experiments show that when you move the cancer nucleus into a new cytoplasm that has normal mitochondria, you get normal cells normal development, sometimes you can clone a whole mouse or a frog from the nucleus of the tumor cell that contains the so-called driver mutations that are supposed to drive the disease, but it doesn't. On the other hand, if you take the normal nucleus and put it into a neoplastic cytoplasm, you end up with dead cells or tumor cells. This, these data from these experiments are the strongest evidence available anywhere to say that cancer is not a nuclear genetic disease. So with that knowledge, how do we now view the nature of cancer? Because it's, if we're going to correct this disease, we need to understand the origin of the disease. So what we have here, now we focus on the left, the mitochondria, and we have this oncogenic paradox, which has plagued the field for decades, was first pointed out by Albert St. Georgi. And you know, how is it possible that all these provocative agents from the microenvironment or from inherited genes could possibly cause cancer through a common pathophysiological mechanism? And the answer is, these different agents, carcinogens, radiation, rare inherited mutations, viruses, they all damage the respiration of the cell, producing reactive oxygen species, which are mutagenic and carcinogenic. So the mutations that we see in the nucleus are downstream epiphenomena of the damage to the respiration. The, the, the respiratory capacity of the cell now suffers. The cell says, I'm, I'm, I'm suffocating which then sends signals to the nucleus, upregulating oncogenes, which are transcription factors for substrate level phosphorylation, which is a fermentation metabolism. So what happens then is the green line goes down, which is oxphos, 
the breathing of the cancer cell. And then the red line, which is substrate level phosphorylation, which occurs in, the, in glycolysis in the cytoplasm and in the mitochondria through amino acid fermentation. And this is driven by oncogenes, which are bringing in the fuels to drive the fermentation. So then we can put together all of the major factors and f findings of the disease in light of a mitochondrial metabolic disease. So you have the Warburg effect and mitochondrial, mitochondrial fermentation. And the Warburg, is, as Otto Warburg said, the Warburg is an effect. It's an effect of damage to the respiration in, some, in one way or another. Then what happens, the first three Hanahan and uh, Weinberg hallmarks, the cell enters the default state. The default state is the state that a cell is in when it's no longer under active control, okay? This is the state that cells were in before oxygen came on the planet, all right? All the cells were fermenting. They fermented, and they fermented as long as fuels were present in the microenvironment, and then they would die when the fermentable fuels. So these cells are falling back, and those first three hallmarks are simply the expression of what these cells were doing before oxygen came on the planet. Now, they throw out m metabolites into the microenvironment, and that leads to angiogenesis. So angiogenesis is simply a response to the, to the uh, inflamed uh, wound kind of environment in the, in the um, uh, microenvironment. Okay, so what controls the cell death? Apoptosis. The mitochondria is the kill switch for the cell. So if the kill switch doesn't work, the cells evade apoptosis. Then the key thing here is metastasis. How do we get metastasis? Where are these metastatic cancer cells coming from? Okay, so what we know is that um, <coughs> cancers will start in epithelial cells, and um, they begin to then express the fermentation behavior, and you see this population of blue cells now with damaged uh, respiration starting to ferment. This elicits a response on the immune systems to say we have an immune, we have an unhealed wound. The immune systems come in to try to, a macrophages to try to heal the wound. They throw out growth factors and cytokines to make the situation even worse, wrong, a context in the wrong context. And to further, to try to heal the wound, macrophages are very fusogenic, right? These, to facilitate wound healing, they fuse. So the very cells that are trying to put out the fire are actually becoming part of the fire. Their, mito their, their cytoplasms are becoming diluted with, with, uh, with abnormal mitochondria from the stem cells, which the stem cells cannot metastasize because they're not genetically programmed to do that. So what we end up with are these hybrid macrophages, uh, fused hybrids, which are now genetically programmed. The macrophage is programmed to enter and exit the, the circulation, survive immune attack. It's one of the most powerful system uh, cells that we have in our bodies. Excuse me. So what we have now is ro are rogue macrophages. Now these guys live in hypoxic environments, so anti-angiogenic therapies are, are basically not going to work to kill those kinds of cells. And the other thing is they love glutamine, all right? So they're part of our immune system. They're, they're, they're glutamine hogs. They're, um, they're, they can survive immune attack. They can do all kinds of things. So we're dealing with one of the toughest cells, and this is the origin of, of metastasis. So I'm going to illustrate some of these things now with glioblastoma. And um, uh, this is a terrible, you know, as we know, this is a terrible disease, poor prognosis, no effective therapies, <coughs> excuse me, um, composed of multiple cell types. That's why we call it uh, multiforme, different kinds of stem cells, neoplastic mesenchymal macroglia. It's highly um, invasive according to secondary structures of Shara. And um, doesn't happen often, but when GBM cells get out of the brain, they're highly metastatic. Okay, here's, a, here's an example of uh, glioblastoma. You can see the, the compression of the, of the ventricles. This is the gross picture. Uh, the, these cells have already migrated through the brain. They go around blood vessels. You can see the, the, the tumor cells around. They use the blood vessels as kind of a railway track system to throughout the brain. It's very hard to control this kind of a tumor, and most patients die from intracranial pressure. Now, well, one of the things we know, not only in GBM, but in most cancer cells, regardless of what tissue they come from, the mitochondria abnormal. And this is a GBM mitochondria with the criste missing. Okay, the stripes that you see in the norm, this is an electron micrograph, that contains the proteins and the lipids of, elect of the electron transport chain. So uh, if, you, if the very structure is missing, there's no way that this organelle is going to produce energy through oxidative phosphorylation, and consequently it's going to have to ferment in order for the cell to survive. So what you have then is you, you have a powerful fermentation in the, in the matrix of the mitochondria, and you have a powerful fermentation in the cytoplasm, and that's what's driving the beast. The beast is being driven by fermentation. And 
we know of no tumor cell that has been found. Those stripes also contain cardiolipin, a, a, a key lipid in the electron transport chain. No tumor has yet been found, published anywhere in the literature, showing that they have normal content or composition of cardiolipin. Therefore, they're going to have to ferment. So what are they fermenting? They're fermenting glucose and they're fermenting glutamine. So you can see glucose on the top. Glucose comes in through the transporters that are upregulating cancer cells. They generate energy through the emden hopaz pathway. They throw out lactic acid. They also generate antioxidants. They, they build uh, precursors for DNA and RNA synthesis. Glutamine comes in on the other side. Glutamine, the amide nitrogen, is used for nucleotide synthesis. The, ga the glutamate can be dumped out and also used. It comes into the mitochondria and generates energy through the TCA substrate, uh, substrate level phosphorylation in the TCA cycle. So these two fuels are the, are the drivers of the beast, all right? If you don't control these fuels, and they also prevent, they cause resistance to chemo and radiation because the fermentation pathway is so powerful, it, it, it protects these cells from that. So in order to control cancer, you're going to have to remove the fuels of fermentation, which are basically glucose and glutamine. How do you do that? Well, let me tell you what we're doing. Before I tell you how we should do it, let me tell you what we are actually doing. All right, so this is a standard of care for, oh, okay, thank you. Right. Cheers. Uh, could, you, could you put a little something stronger in there? <laughs> so uh, what we have here is a, a cartoon showing uh, what, we gener what we generally do now uh, for treating uh, glioblastoma in the clinic, all right? So we immediately surgically resect, okay, that's the first thing we do, surgically resect, creating a nice wound, a wound now that's going to give the inflammatory cells an opportunity to grow. And then we irradiate, all right, and we break apart the glucose glutamine cycle. This is very important to understand this. So we're going to free up the very powerful fuel that's going to drive the beast. And then uh, when, this, when, the, when this kind of treatment starts to cause the brain to swell, we give them dexamethasone, and we heard how, how not good that is. So we give dexamethasone, which elevates blood sugar. So what we have done, essentially, is created a system where we have provided the very fuels that are driving the beast, all right, by, by, by the very standards of what we're doing. Many of these tumors are infected with human cytomegalovirus, which is a supercharger for using glucose and glutamine. We create the perfect storm of adverse effects in the brain of the patient being treated for glioblastoma. Now, what do you think this kind of treatment is going to do for the outcome of these patients? There's the results from stuff. Okay, so radiation alone, zero survivors. With temozolomide, a toxic alkylating agent, we have a little bit better pr uh, progression-free survival, but overall, this is abysmal. This is what I would expect. This is what we would expect if what we're doing to these patients is, is based on the, on the mitochondrial metabolic theory. Okay, so let's change the system. How, if we know that this disease is a mitochondrial metabolic disease, how can we best eliminate and treat the disease? So we've come up with this idea of the press pulse. This is actually taken from the, the field of paleobiology. And um, it's considered a, a mechanism responsible for the mass extinction of organisms on this planet. And it, these mass extinctions have occurred only when two unlikely events occurred simultaneously, okay? So we have a press that puts a lot of pressure on the population, and then we have an acute pulse, and together the press and the pulse causes an extermination of populations. So we adapted this concept to um, manage cancer. And here's our paper that just came out recently. So we have this Vitruvian man symbol. On the, re on the left, he's full of cancer. Uh, in the middle, he's becoming managed, and on the right, he's resolved. So how are we going to do this using the concept of press pulse from the field of paleobiology? We use ketogenic diets restricted, ketone supplementation. Ketogenic diets will lower blood glucose, one of the fuels that drives the beast, and ketones are upregulated, which are a non-fermentable fuel. So the ketones are really there to help the normal cells uh, achieve, uh, stay alive and function while we're pushing those blood sugars to the lowest possible levels. You don't have to worry about hypoglycemia if you, if you ha are in therapeutic ketosis. At the same time, we use stress management. Many of these cancer patients are freaked out. They're all emotionally upset. They have all kinds of things. We, we use uh, exercise. We use uh, yoga. We use uh, music therapy. We use a lot of different things. You've got to keep that patient in a, in a very calm, 
uh, um, uh, set of emotions. And then we pulse with glucose inhibitors, uh, glutamine inhibitors, and hyperbaric oxygen. We think hyperbaric oxygen can replace radiation. Why are you going to kill? It works the same way, right? You're going to kill these cells by oxidative stress. So why are we going to uh, irradiate somebody when we can use hyperbaric oxygen to make them healthy? So basically, we're going to press, we're going to press and pulse, scheduling, timing, and dosaging. We heard some of this. And the patients will have these tumors degraded logically and, and non-toxically so that they will emerge from the therapy healthier than when they started. We can achieve management without toxicity. And that's the key. That's the key you have to recognize. So we, we started to test these hypotheses in the GBM model that we developed at Boston College, which essentially has the same uh, behavioral growth characteristics as we see for human glioblastoma. You can see the intrafascicular, interfascicular. Look at the beautiful blood vessels around the, of the, the tumor cells around the blood vessel, the perivascular. They, they, this model replicates exactly what goes on in the human GBM. Now, here's our attempt to manage this. Um, the one on the left is the tumor when you, when you, and the high, standard high carbohydrate diet, these cells can't grow any faster. You, I don't know if we can, you know, goose them any, make them grow any faster. You put a high carbohydrate diet, these things are crazy. They'll move from one side of the brain to the other side of the brain as fast as possible doing the sub, uh, invasive properties. We hit them with everything. We hit them with ketogenic diets, calorie restriction, fasting, all this kind of stuff. We were able to significantly reduce the invasive properties of the tumor, but we weren't able to kill it. What's going on here? We took all the glucose, as much glucose as we got out of it. We, we have anti-angiogenic therapy. There's no more powerful anti-angiogenic therapy than calorie restriction, and we wrote papers on that. We have the data to prove that. It was anti-inflammatory. We hit them with everything, and the tumor is still there. So we're saying, what the hell's going on here? We're, we're, we're doing everything. And we said, what about glutamine? Does the ketogenic diet or the calories target glutamine? The answer is no. Okay, what happens when you target glutamine? So we tested this hypothesis using a glutamine inhibitor called DON. It's a 6-diazo-5 oxal. It's been used in the past um, sporadically for treating people with cancer. Children with, with leukemias did very well on it. Other people didn't because they didn't target the glucose. I'll show you the, the evidence for this. So what this drug does is it stops TCA cycle substrate level phosphorylation and halts DNA and RNA synthesis. All right, so this is, a, this is a very nice kind of drug that's going to shut down the back door because I said we shut down the front door, but these cells are still alive because we didn't do anything to the glutamine. So what happens when we hit the glutamine? So here's our experimental design. We put the, we put the tumor cells into the mouse's brain. And we let the tumor wait three days because now it's going to be a raging GBM. And then we put them on a therapeutic fast for 18 hours. And then we refeed them the either high carb diet or the ketogenic diet restricted. And we pulse with Don, boom, 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 every other couple of days. And of course, the guys eating high carb diets are dying at 15 days. So this is a nice experiment. You get the whole GBM study done in 15 days because the, this, the guys on the standard diet are dropping dead or they're getting really morbid. And then we examine the mice at, at the different things. Now, these cells are also labeled with uh, luciferase, so you can, you can see them under the bioluminescence. And you can see standard diet. You have to have put sunglasses on. There's so much light coming out of those tumor cells from, the, from eating all the glucose, right? The ketogenic diet, just a little bit, a little bit. We're saying, geez, you know, what's going on? But you put the diet with the Don, and you get no light, all right? We blasted these things out. You don't have any light in the brain. The mice are really healthy. They're looking great. And then we here's the diet versus the diet with Don. And the, the, the low little bars there are background, so they're not really any living cells. There was one guy, we, we took him off the drug a couple of days, and you can see he was the only guy that had a little bit of light, number six there. And then the other thing we found, which is really remarkable, is that when you give the drug in the presence of the diet, you get three times more drug into the tumor than if you give the drug in the high-carbohydrate diet. So the ketogenic diet is essentially facilitating the delivery of the drug to the tumor so you don't have to use as high concentration and keep the toxicity down. And this drug doesn't have much toxicity uh, when used at the concentrations that we do. Now, what's going on inside the brain uh, of this mouse that's being treated? So here you have on the left the high-carb diet. In the middle, you have the ketogenic diet restricted. And on the right, you have the diet with the Don. Now look, the, the tumor cells could not be any more invasive or healthy in the high carbohydrate. You want your tumor to grow fast, get that sh blood sugar up. If you get the sugar up as high as you can, and those tumor cells will grow super fast. You take the sugar away, and you stop the invasion, all right, which is, you see the white part of the brain, that's the, that's the clean brain, and the tumor cells are not as invasive. And they also have more spaces between them. So it's very interesting. The diet is, in fact, having some impact on the way these tumor cells are growing in the brain. 
But on the, on the right high side, you get a, a m massive mitotic catastrophe. We slaughtered those tumor cells by taking away their glucose and taking away their glutamine. Slaughter them. And that accounts for why we have no light in the brain. And then, of course, I told you that these cells are highly metastatic outside the brain. It's just like a human GBM. It doesn't happen often, but if human GBM cells get outside, they metastasize throughout the system. And our work with Angela Poff and Dom D'Agostino, uh, we were able to show that when we put the cells in the flank, they spread throughout the whole mouse. And we use hyperbaric oxygen in this case. And hyperbaric oxygen by itself, it didn't do too much. It was a little bit of effect, the diet by itself, a little bit of effect, but you put the two together, hyperbaric oxygen, because now we're taking away the, the shield against antioxidant defense, and the hyperbaric oxygen is now starting to kill the cells through oxidative stress, only after you remove some of the, the protective uh, glucose from the diet. Now, we, as we heard earlier today, we like to see the face of people who have uh, experienced uh, some of these uh, uh, treatments. And this is Pablo Kelly, who contacted me back in August 2014 when he was diagnosed with a glioblastoma. So Pablo, young man, 28 years old, um, rejects standard of care. He said, I don't want any radiation, I don't want any chemo, I don't want anything except metabolic therapy. So I, I, I designed, you know, I said, okay, do this, do that. He apparently did it. Um, and uh, uh, what happened was uh, he had an inoperable GBM. And then after two and a half years, which was just this last winter, Pablo's tumor now becomes resectable. So he goes in and has his tumor resected. And the last I heard from him, which was last week, he has no evidence of, of cancer in his, in his brain. So um, and now he's out three years. He's now in September 2017. And he's doing fine. His quality of life is super high. He says he wants to get married now. So what's going on here, you know? A three-year guy for GBM is what we call a long-term survivor. Now the question is, is Pablo Kelly the exception or is Pablo Kelly the rule, all right? It's my personal opinion that Pablo is alive because he avoided those therapies that are gonna increase glucose and glutamine in his brain, all right? That's my personal view, and I think Pablo is just a pioneer in this field, and um, he'll be, we're gonna get many more, and we are getting them uh, like that. Now, here's our most recent paper that we just published in Curus uh, with, our with our colleagues from Turkey. And, and they're using a press pulse strategy based on our concepts. Uh, for This is for triple negative breast cancer. And uh, this woman came in, and she was, I um, can't remember how old she was, in the 30s. And you can see on her left breast, she has a large tumor. This is triple negative breast cancer that had spread to her liver and her abdomen. And uh, we put her on a, a combined ketogenic with some very low dose chemo ketogenic diet, hypothermia, hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and uh, insulin potentiation therapy. What we're doing is pounding down her blood sugar levels. She's very, very, uh, she, her, she had quali high quality of life, no toxicity, and you can see the results, and she's still doing fine. And we have more and more, and the, the group from Turkey are using this concept to manage advanced pancreatic cancer. Uh, these are all stage four cancers, lung, pancreas, colon, ovary, all stage fours, using the same kind of therapy working the same way in all these different cancers. Why? Because cancer is a singular disease of energy metabolism. There's, cancer is not a complicated disease. We've made it as a species. We've made that disease complicated, all right, by chasing all these genes that are largely irrelevant to the nature of the disease. If they need glucose, they need glutamine. You take away glucose and glutamine, you keep the patient happy, healthy, and cancer-free. Now, how long will these people remain? They say, well, it's going, to it's going to be resistant to what? If you take away the two primary fuels, there's no way, they're, they're checkmate. So, cancer is a type of mitochondrial metabolic disease. It is not a genetic disease. A reliance on substrate level phosphorylation is the hallmark of nearly all or nearly all cancers. They're the same disease. They will respond similarly to the same treatment. They use glucose and they use glutamine to ferment. Press pulse metabolic therapy is a non-toxic, cost-effective strategy for cancer management. And it's my personal view that if this becomes part of the standard of care, we will eventually drop those numbers very significantly. And the groups that I'd like to thank in the United States, uh, my colleagues in Turkey, in Germany, in Venezuela, Hungary, Greece, France, and Egypt, and more and more of these uh, uh, groups are starting to recognize the, p the power and potential of metabolic therapies for managing cancer. Thank you.